Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my weekly video series in which I cover an older board game that I happen to think is a gem. Maybe it's a hidden gem. Uh, I just like to talk about older games and remind people that they're still good. You don't always have to seek out good gaming experiences from the new games that are out there. Lots of great old games too. So the game I'm talking about this week came out in 2006 originally. Uh, designed by Sebastian Bleasdale and published by JKLM, which is an English publisher. I don't think they're around anymore. And it's called On the Underground. Here it is here. Uh, it's for two to five players. The box says seven and up. No, uh, more like, I would say probably 10 and up is a better estimate. And the box says 60 minutes. Again, no. Uh, more like a 90 minute game and that's regardless of the number of players. I am cheating a little bit this week because this is not really some older gem that maybe people aren't talking about anymore. People are actually still talking about this game and uh, I'm happy that they are but I still wanted to cover it because I happen to like the game quite a bit. So this one came out in 2006 and around 2017, 2018 a new edition came out. This one is from Luda Creations. And the presentation is quite nice. Now it has um, an extra map. So the previous version was just the London Underground. And this one has London and Berlin maps. It has a double-sided board. And the presentation is, is quite pleasing. It's a very stylish looking game. This was on Kickstarter, was successful. Interestingly, the ratings for the two games are quite different. So this one is about maybe high sixes. It's like 6.8, 6.9. This one's more like a 7.4, 7.5 on Board Game Geek. And at least for, maybe the Berlin map is amazing. I don't know, I haven't played it. But the London map and the, the rules are almost identical with the two versions. So I'm really surprised and happy that the new edition uh, is so well regarded. So I'm gonna show you how it plays and I'm gonna use this edition because that's the one you're more likely to find in stores. And then I'll talk about why it's a gem. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. Take these branch tokens, they're little half circles, and just put them to the side somewhere. And these green tokens, you're gonna mix them up, and then you're gonna place one on each of the green spaces. And players will get bonuses if they can use their lines to connect like symbols. This is the passenger. He's going to start at Euston Station. Shuffle up the deck of cards and flip over four. Each card in the deck represents one silver or gold station on the board. For each of the gold cards that are revealed, place a gold marker on that station. And for every silver card, add a silver marker. Determine a start player who will get this marker, and each player will get score markers and tracks based on the number of players. In a two-player game, each player will get four colors of tracks, these four colors. In a three-player game, each will get three colors, and in a four or five-player game, each player will get two colors. We're going to set this up for a three-player game. So these are the three players. Place the score markers. And then give each player their three colors of tracks. So the goal of the game is to get the most points. And you get points in a few different ways. But over the course of the game, players are going to be creating lines of track. So if you live in a large city that has a subway, of course, your, your city may have multiple lines. They'll there's usually a single line going from this location to this location with a lot of stops in between. In this game, there will be, in the three-player game, there'll be up to nine lines here in London, three of which are owned by a single player. And each line will score its owner points in a few different ways. If a line, a single line, so a single color line, connects two symbols, two green symbols of the same uh, symbol, 
then the player will score three points. But it has to be the same line, so not red and orange, but just red or just orange. And for every pair, that's the case. Anytime a line connects up to one of these blue stations, which is a national rail station, you'll get one point. Every time a line ends at a terminus station, which is these red ones, the player will get two points and a branch token. And branch tokens can be used, as the name implies, to have a line branch off. Normally you can only add tracks on the ends of the line, but the branch tokens will allow you to change that. If you're able to make a loop of tracks, all of your single color, then you'll get one point for every station inside that loop, not including the stations on the loop. So if a red player were able to draw a red line and make a big loop like that, then all these stations that are fully inside the loop would score the player one point. But the most interesting way of scoring points is via the passenger. The passenger will move around the board at the end of each player's turn to some of these stations. And every line the passenger takes to get to a station will give its owner one point. And so a big part of the game is building lines toward the stations that the passenger wants to go to so that the passenger will take their line and score that player points. So as I said, determine a start player. The start player will get this marker. You're going to play complete rounds. So each player is going to have the same number of turns. And the starting player is going to get three actions. Normally every player gets four actions, but the starting player will only get three. And the last player in the round, so the player to the right of the start player, will actually get five actions. But going forward from there, each player will have four actions. There are two ways to spend actions. One, you can spend an action to get a branch token. We'll talk about branch tokens later. But the other is to build tracks. We'll say the red, orange, pink player is the uh, first player. And all players should note that you don't have the same number of tracks um, for each of the different colors. So in this case, actually red has, I think, five more tracks than the orange and pink lines. So a player on their turn, they spend an action to place one track and they can place tracks from any of their colors. If you're starting a track, and there's no, there's no tracks of that color on the board, then you can place it anywhere on these lines. But once you place a track, from that point forward, all tracks of that color must extend from the ends. So the red player, for example, could do something like this and then could actually start a new line, maybe the pink, somewhere else. Like this, for example. Now the tracks go on these lines, and these lines of course can only have one track. You'll see some connections actually have multiple lines, so multiple colors of track can be on those lines, but each color has to be different. Pink, for example, could not have two tracks going into the same place. But normally you have to build off the ends. So once, now that red the red-pink player has these tracks built. From now on, if she wants to build red, she'll have to build from the end. So from this station or from this station. And likewise from pink, either build from this station or, or from this station. So always have to extend the line in one of the two ends. The way around that is by spending branch tokens. If you give up two branch tokens, that's why they're semicircles. So when you have two, like so, you have a complete circle, you can turn them in, and then you can build a track off of the line anywhere on the line. So you could do something like this, for example. That would be a single branch. And now this player could build off of the pink line either here or here or here. Of course, I put down four tracks, but the start player would only be allowed to put down three. So let's say, Let's say actually the player did something like this. So that's the three actions, one, two, three. Of course, if you connect up to 
these blue stations, red stations, or connect two green stations of the same symbol, then you immediately get points. But at the end of your turn, after you've finished your actions, you've put down your tracks, maybe claimed some of these branch tokens, now the passenger moves. And this is, this is the key of the game, and this is the most fun part of the game. There are two different types of, of stations. There's gold and there's silver. On a player's turn, there might just be silver or just be gold, but there'll always be four stations represented by four markers on the board. The passenger will always go to a gold station, if possible, and then will always go to a silver station, if possible. If they're all gold, of course, they'll only go to a gold station, but one gold station. If they're all silver, then they'll go to one silver station. If, in this case, there's both colors are present, they'll go to one gold and then from there to one silver. But the passenger isn't picky. The passenger will go to whichever gold or silver station is the easiest for them to get to. The passenger hates walking, but they'll walk if they have to. They will pick the station in which they have to walk the least in order to get there. So this passenger, for example, if they wanted to go to this station, they would have to walk three stations to get there. But in to this station, they would only have to walk one distance because they could take a train part of the way. So this passenger would choose to go to this station. And they will travel this track to here, giving its owner one point for the color. They traveled on pink, and so the owner of pink will get one point and then they'll walk the rest of the distance to here. Now that card would then go away. We'll come back, we'll, we'll add more later. But now this passenger will go to one of the silver stations. To go to this one would require walking to here, taking the subway, and then walking two more stops. But to get to this one, they could walk here, take the subway two lengths, and then just walk one. So this one only requires two walks. This one requires three. So the passenger will choose to go here. He'll walk to here, take the train along pink. Again, pink would get one point for a total of two. One point for going to here, taking this line, and one point for going here, taking this line and the passenger would walk the rest of the way. And now this card goes away, and we draw replacements such that there are now four stations. And now it's the next player's turn. And the next player has to keep in mind that this passenger will 100% definitely want to go to this station because it is the only gold-colored station. And right now, the passenger would, would have to take the train along the pink line in order to get to here. For example, the next player in turn order could do something like this. The next player has four actions. They could do something like this. And so in this case, the passenger would then first travel to here. So what would the passenger do? The passenger would walk to Finchley Road then take the pink line to Oxford Circus, then the black line to here. And both pink and black will give its owners one point. And now the passenger will go to one of these three stations. And again, the passenger doesn't really care which one it goes to, but it'll go to the one that's easiest. And the only one that the passenger can get to without having to walk is this one to Moorgate. They can take this black line straight to Moorgate, and they will do so. And black will get another point. The player will always go to the station that requires the least walking, and if there's a tie, they'll go to the station that requires the fewest transfers. So if one station requires them to take two lines to get there, and another one only requires one, then they would take the one line. If the passenger has two different stations that they could go to and it's equally effortless, there's equal effort to go to both stations and the player whose turn it is can choose which station they go to. But in the case of a tie, the player whose turn it is gets to choose and that's a big part of the game as well. 
So the game continues like that. Players will be using up their tracks. Once a track color is completely used up, they can't use that track color anymore. But of course they have other lines they can start. They can start new lines whenever they want, just in different parts of the, of the map, for example. And continue like that until the deck runs out. And then you finish the round. When you finish the round, it's possible that will be uh, you'll run out of cards so the players later in the round actually won't have any cards for the passenger to go to so in that case the passenger doesn't move at all but of course you can still get points from the green tokens from the national rail uh, stations from the terminus stations there's lots of ways of scoring points in the game importantly there is no end game scoring all the scoring you get during the game that's all there will be that's it you're ready to play on the underground So I'm sort of cheating a little bit this week because there are two versions of On the Underground. And this version, this is the more recent one, just came out a couple of years ago. Uh, obviously by the time this is recorded. Um, maybe you're viewing this video 10 years later, I don't know. But anyways, it came out, oh, what is it? Well, I want to say like 2017, 2018. And the ratings are really, really high, like 7.5 or something on Board Game Geek. That's really good. Um, but this version, the older version, um, its ratings are not that great, maybe about a 6.9. So, I mean, obviously this one comes with an extra map, the Berlin map, which I haven't tried. So, I mean, that's good. And the presentation is quite pleasant. But, like, the game itself for the London map is almost exactly the same. So, for me, it's just hard to understand why this game was kind of, like, high sixes, and this one is, like, a full, at least, like, a half point higher. Um, but I'm happy because this was definitely a hidden gem uh, when it came out. Uh, it was published by JKLM, which is an English company, and I don't think they're in operation anymore. I think they're kind of defunct. I'm not sure what their distribution was like. Oh, okay, so this was actually originally from JKLM, but I see it's also co-published by uh, Rio Grande Games, so there you go. So it would have had decent distribution, but for whatever reason, didn't set the world on fire, not sure why. Um, I think the presentation is quite nice, like even the box cover, when I had this in the restaurant, lots of people uh, were interested in it and wanted to try it. And of course, it looked a little bit like Ticket to Ride, and people like Ticket to Ride, so they wanted to try this one. Um, but I'm happy that I got a new version, if for no other reason than, obviously, a new map, but also because uh, now people seem to finally be appreciating it, that it's something really nice, good, special. Um, so much so that they are doing a new version, so it'll be Paris and New York, I think. And Paris was, as far as I know, the Paris one was actually already done. The, like, the designer actually did a, an expansion, like an unofficial expansion, for the old version for Paris. Uh, so that's already done. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to seeing uh, Paris and New York. Uh, and I'm really happy that people now seem to be appreciating this game when the old version was certainly a hidden gem. Let's compare the two editions a little bit. So, I mean, I think it's fair for some people if they want to say that the presentation on this one is not as good. Um, this one, the box art is a little bit strange. I don't know a good way to describe it. It's perfectly serviceable, but looks a little bit sloppy or something. I, I can't quite phrase it very well. Uh, certainly, this is a very nice presentation, this one, very stylish. And in terms of the board maps, uh, again, this one looks a, just beautiful looking board. And this one is a uh, much more, I mean, they're both abstract looking, but this one is a little bit more, I don't know, stark. I'm not sure if that's the right word. This one is kind of more flowing and and uh, and pretty that way. But the old version is a little more functional because it actually has proper spaces on the on, between the stations to place the tracks. And they have little lines connecting up to them from the stations to the track spaces. So even if you have a few tracks on the board, you can see how many tracks are allowed. Unfortunately, with this version, that's not the case. So instead they chose, and I'm not sure why, kind of uh, casual strokes, like with a, a brush or pen uh, to mark the lines. 
and looks nice, but once you it once you have like a track or two on there, it can be hard to see. And this one never had a problem. And this one, after, uh, even, every game I played, I found that at least one person was like makes a play, and then you had to point out. I was like, oh, actually, uh, yeah, that the only one track is allowed there. It's like, oh, I thought it was two. There is a slight difference in the rules between the two editions. So, in on the underground, there is no accommodation made for players going early in turn order versus late. Uh, every player has the same number of actions, which is four. In the new edition, they say the first player gets only three actions, and the last player in in the round gets five. Uh, just for that first round, right? And then all the other rounds after that, of course, they're all four. But just for that first round, a little bit of uh, accommodation there, which I think is worthwhile, um, especially because at the end of the game, the uh, especially the way th these rules are set up, it's possible that the passenger will not move on the later turns. Because what happens in this edition, the old edition, is that... Uh, once the draw pile is compl is depleted, so there's four cards face up and none in the draw pile, you're supposed to immediately remove the passenger. So, and of course that triggers the end of the game, but and you finish the round, but then the players later in that round, they can't benefit from the passenger. Instead, they have to, you know, get points by just, you know, connecting up to terminus stations, for example. Whereas this one, the passenger keeps moving. But those are two very small changes. And for what it's worth, of course, you can apply those new changes to the old edition. So you happen to come across an old edition. Um, this is perfectly fine. Of course, it wouldn't have the Berlin map, but otherwise, this is quite serviceable. Um, the components are a little bit different. The score, the score markers in this one are wood with stickers on them. Uh, this one is cardboard. The publisher, Uda Creations, said that they don't do stickers, which is... Uh, Kind of an interesting stance. Stickers. They go against everything we stand for. I happen to like having the wooden discs with the stickers on them, preferable to the cardboard tiles and score markers. Again, maybe personal preference. The score markers are quite big, these cardboard ones. Um, this one only has four markers to mark the four stations that the passenger may visit in a round. And they're all the same color. And it's important to be able to see there's gold and there's silver. There's different types of stations. And what I ended up doing for this edition was putting a little, because they're I think they're white or maybe a light gray, I ended up putting little yellow stickers on one end of it. You know, I could have it oriented one way or the other, depending on whether it's a gold station or a silver station. But, you know, stickers wasn't going to happen. So instead, they actually give you twice as many. They give you four gold and four silver because they don't know what kind of combination will come up. Oh, I will say there's a deluxe edition of this too, like from Kickstarter. I checked out the Kickstarter and I, for a long, long time, have been into deluxe editions of games. And you'd think with Kickstarter nowadays, I would be in my zone, right? It's like so many deluxe editions of games coming out. But anyway, the deluxe edition of this, I'm not sure all the changes, but they, they're just nicer pieces like for the passenger and like custom shaped pieces like Big Ben for the London map. And it's like, okay, that's neat and all, but you know what? I just, I think I prefer the retail. So I actually, even though I was 100% on board with getting the new edition of this game, was very excited about it. I deliberately avoided the Kickstarter because I preferred the retail edition. This game, is best in my opinion with three players. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who swear by it with two. Two is fine as well. Um, but I find three is a sweet spot and then four is like eh, and then five. Uh, five is right out. Uh, I, I don't think I would... I mean I love the game so I guess I would be willing to play it with five. That's the thing right? Like if a game isn't very good with five players but it can support it very easily with all the components that are in there, they don't need to add much in the way of extra components. Why not support it? Yes, it's not as good, but if you love the game, you'd probably still like it even at the higher player count. For hobbyists though, I need to warn you that for five players, it's a long time before it comes around to your turn. 
See, this is the type of game that has basically the same or similar numbers of turns, no matter the number of players, which is great because it keeps the game length kind of expected um, within an expected range. But it means that with more players, each player has fewer chances of doing fun stuff by the time the game is over, right? So picture a two-player game versus a four-player game. You have half the turns in a four-player game that you would with a two. This game is susceptible to downtime with more players, and the reason is because it's a thinky game. Uh, it's thinky like a lot of the games I feature on this channel. So the only randomness, and there's kind of two parts of the randomness. One is just the initial setup. There's, <clears throat> again, I'm talking about the London map. Haven't played the Berlin map. There's uh, eight green tokens. And there's eight positions on the board, and you just mix them up. You put the eight on the eight spaces kind of randomly. And that's the only variability in setup. And then, of course, there's a deck of cards, the passenger cards. And, of course, that's a completely random order when those passenger cards are going to come out, but they're all going to come out. You're going to see them all by the end of the game. doesn't mean the passenger will go to every station, because by the end there might be some stations that the passenger can't get to. The game ends before that happens, but you will see every card. And the nice thing is that this creates a nice balance between short-term and long-term goals. So the short-term goal is the passenger, right? The passenger is moving around, and it can be a little bit confusing to figure out for some people like how the passenger moves. It's hard for them to predict. Uh, I find it quite easy. It reminds me a little bit of Fresh Fish in this way, in that if your brain works a certain way, it's like super obvious, but for some people, their brain just doesn't quite work that way, you know? And so they're going to have a hard time visualizing. It's like, okay, so if I do nothing, where is the passenger going to go? There. Okay, so if I do this, does that mean now the passenger will take my line? No? Okay, how about now? Like some people just have a hard time visualizing it. It's very clever, though, how the passenger moves. So the passenger is moving around and you can get points during the game by kind of being one step ahead of the passenger, right? Oh, you know the passenger is going to go to these stations next or one of these stations next. On my turn, I'm going to build tracks in a certain area so I get points for the passenger traveling my, my line. But you can't just think about that sort of short term, you know, just playing for the passenger for the right now. You do have to kind of keep an eye on the big picture because the map, London map, is the same every game and it has ins and outs. I actually like, you know, games like this, right? You know, you know, there are some games that like, you know, you have like Power Grid, which has like a set map, right? Then you have something like Power Grid for Sparks, which is like, okay, now there's like a variable map, right? There's different tiles and you put them together in random combinations. And I generally like random setups, but it is fun to learn the ins and outs of a game board, of a map. So you play the same map from game to game, and of course there's other random elements, but you learn the ins and outs of the map. You learn like, oh, this is kind of an important area to be in, oh, this isn't, right? Um, that's why actually one of my favorite pandemics is uh, Rising Tides because the map is so, of the Netherlands, is so interesting, and each area is, is unique, so it's really fun to kind of explore. Anyway, a little bit off topic there. So I enjoy learning the ins and outs of the maps, and what you find out as you play the game, so as you play it multiple times, is that, you know, some parts of the board are kind of more important than the others, and you can still see, even your first game, you can see, because again, you can see all the stations, and all the stations will be seen, will come out at some point during the game. So you can build for the long term. You can say, like, I know we haven't seen any stations in this area yet, but they will come later. And if I can get, and you know, the edges of the board have fewer track spaces. So really only one player, maybe two can get in there, but it's easy to get blocked. So there is blocking in this game. Oh, yes. So... You can kind of plan ahead and go, well, I'm going to build into that area early before other people do. I'm not going to wait for the passenger. I'm going to put my line in there early. Eventually, those stations will come up, and then my line is well situated for that. So there's room to explore the game over multiple games, is what I'm trying to say. 
And of course, then once you're bored of London map, you can switch to the Berlin map. There's always something you can do on your turn. Because even if you can't build for the passenger for right now, you can, of course, build for the future. But there's lots of different ways of scoring points, right? You can get little points here and there connecting the national rail lines. You can get the, uh, the terminus stations, which uh, give you not bad points. In fact, my son won the first game we played, the three of us, a family, uh, by connecting to a lot of terminus stations, just getting points that way, getting a lot of branch tokens as a result, and then using those branch ter tokens to branch out and connect to more terminus stations, and actually ended up winning the game by a, not a tiny margin. So there's lots of different ways to score points, of course, connecting the green tokens as well. Um, so even if, like, the passenger appears on a station and the station that he has to get to is on the same line, well, you know, okay, he's going to take that line. Nothing we can do about it, right? So I'll build somewhere else. And there's always something that you can do on your turn. But it can be a process to kind of think it out. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's a thinky game, and so there might be a bit of downtime. Well, one interesting thing, and it's an interesting design choice... I'm not sure if Berlin changes it at all, but at least for the London map, there is no endgame scoring. None. All the points that you get, you get during the game. Now, this is good and bad. It's good in the sense that it's very straightforward. Like, the rules are really simple, and it, except for the passenger movement, which not everybody's going to get, the rules are just so simple to explain. When you have a game with endgame scoring, Sometimes it's kind of a separate thing. It's like, okay, I have to explain that, and it doesn't feel the same as the first part of the game. It's like almost you're playing like a second game on top of the first game. And then as you get closer to the end of the game, you're going, okay, I just want to remind everybody about the, the end game scoring. And then you hear people saying, oh, I forgot about that. Or, you know, I would have done something differently then, or whatever. Now, so this has no end game scoring. And that can be a good thing in terms of teaching and simplicity, like I said. But... There is a downside, and that is that the end of the game can be telegraphed a little bit. With no end game scoring, if one person gets a sizable lead, the other players will, even if they're wrong, they will feel as though, oh, I, I'm not going to be able to catch up. And then that can sour them on the game, especially if they have to play for another little while, because this game is long. Both boxes say 60 minutes. That's in my experience, has been kind of a fiction. Maybe if you're speed playing, sure, but because it's a thinky game, I'd say it's at least 90. I shouldn't say at least. It's, in my experience, been about 90 minutes. And it's a great 90 minutes. Like, I'm involved the whole time, and it's really, it's a really fun puzzle to figure out how the passenger moves, right? It's like, oh, okay, so the passenger, if we do nothing, the passenger's gonna go here because, you know, he doesn't have to travel as much, etc., and every time, it's a fun little puzzle to, to work out in your head how the passenger moves. I love that aspect. But when you're kind of planning what to do about it, what to do about the passenger, you know, where to prioritize because you don't want to get blocked. So as a result, people can take their time with their turns. And so my experience is it's more like a 90-minute game. But I just love this design, and I love the, the cleverness of how the passenger moves. I love the really simple rules uh, that are easy to explain, except for the passenger for some people, and that it's a constantly changing puzzle when your turn comes up. Okay, the passenger's going to do this. What can I do about it? What else should I prioritize? And uh, at the end of the game, it really does look like kind of an underground map because you have these different lines going in all these different directions, and uh, it's really evocative. I'm going to say one, one more thing. The new edition uh, of this one, it has a double-sided box. So it looks like this on the box top, which I, I mean, I'm not looking at it right now, but I'm pretty sure it's London. And the box bottom looks like the box top, but it shows Berlin instead of London. And all the box information, like, you know, number of players and component list and stuff, is all on the side of the box. Well, that's great and unique. Um, just what I find is when I put the game away, I invariably put all the pieces and the board in the box top by accident. And then I go to take the other lid and I put it on and I realize the box top for some reason is going <clears throat> inside the bottom instead of outside. 
and of course it doesn't fit because of the components and everything and I'm like oh take everything out again okay minor thing but I just wanted to get that in there this one last little jab I really enjoy this game I find it sometimes hard to put into words why I like games I hope I'm doing an okay job with this channel uh, but I love, of course, the thinkiness of it, the planning of it, the little puzzle of the passenger, the very clever kind of movement. Like I said, it reminds me a bit of Fresh Fish in that, you know, there's certain rules like, oh, this does this. And for me, at least, like in terms of the theme and setting, those things make sense, right? Like you can describe, it's easy to just describe the passenger. The passenger's lazy, right? The passenger doesn't want to walk and doesn't want to take any transfers if it can help it, right? And it's easy to explain, but from that simple rule, it's almost like, you know, Conway's Game of Life, right? It's like simple rules, but from those simple rules, oh, this interesting little kind of development occurs, a little puzzle, and it's really fun to work on that puzzle. So I enjoy this game. Of the new and the old version, which one do I like more? I mean, the old one does take up less shelf space, but of course the new one... I think for most people it would look a lot better, certainly more stylish, and of course it has the Berlin map, so this is the way to go. But I'm definitely uh, looking forward to checking out Paris and New York when it comes out sometime in 2021. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like On the Underground don't stop being good just because new games come out. Take care.